Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is Financing Resilient Power in Underserved Communities Moving Forward with Distributed Solar Plus Storage Projects. We have a number of excellent guest speakers with us today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. We have a couple of options to join the audio portion of today's webinar. You can call in via telephone or you can connect via computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled there and you can also click on that to expand the webinar console. And one of the reasons that you might like to use and view your webinar console is to submit questions and comments. We encourage you to do that. We want to hear from you. We'd like to answer your questions. We'll be saving some time for a Q&A following our presentation. So please do submit your questions as you think of them. Don't wait until the very end. Um, type them in as you think of them. A final note for everyone, we are recording this webinar. We will post the recording on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. We'll also post a PDF of the slides and we will send you an email within about 24 or 48 hours with a link to all of those webinar materials. So, so that's that. That is everyone, everything I have to go over. And with that, I'm going to now pass it over to uh, our moderator for today's webinar, Seth Mullendor. Seth is the Vice President and Project Director here at Clean Energy Group, and he will get us started. Seth? Thank you, Samantha, and thank you for everyone who's joining us today. We have quite a few people on the line joining for the webinar, and that, so that's great. As Sam said, please do get your questions in as you think about them so we can uh, make sure to get to them uh, at the end when we do some, some Q&A time. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our speakers just very quickly today. We have um, a whole bunch of great presenters here. This is going to be a really good uh, webinar. So we're going to start things off. We have uh, Curtis Probst, uh, who is the co-CEO of the uh, New York City Energy Efficiency Corporation, uh, NICE. Then we have Caitlin Kelly, who is the Deputy Director of the Renewable Division uh, RPS for the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. Um, and they're going to be talking about some of the incentives in New York and Massachusetts. We also have uh, Emily Jones, who is a senior program officer with the uh, Green Retrofit Initiative for LISC Boston. Who's going to talk about how uh, these incentives apply to actual projects and to, to folks developing projects. Uh, then we have Christina McPike, who is the Director of Energy and Sustainability for Wind Companies, talking from the developer's perspective, who is uh, working on projects uh, in uh, low-income properties with solar and energy storage. And then finally, we have Thomas Mitchell, who is a Senior Community Development Officer with LISC New York City, to talk about the uh, New York City perspective and how they're approaching projects. We also have on the line with us uh, Rob Sanders, who's Senior Finance Director for Clean Energy Group, and he'll be joining us for, for the Q&A portion. So uh, you heard me talking about Massachusetts and New York. We're going to be talking about the landscape in those markets for developing and financing energy storage and, and solar projects for uh, low-income communities, low-income properties. Uh, but the, uh, the lessons learned from those two states uh, are broadly applicable across the country. You know, a lot depends on what's available in certain markets for what can be done. Um, and these are two areas of the country where projects are now happening and, and happening at a, uh, a stronger pace than they were in the past. So with that, I'm going to leave things off and I'm going to turn things over to Curtis Probst to begin the presentation today, talking about some of uh, the incentives in New York. Great. Thank you very much, Seth. Uh, NYSEEC has a long history of financing solar plus storage. This goes back to a transaction we did for Marcus Garvey Apartments, uh, an affordable multifamily housing project uh, in Brooklyn back in 2016. Uh, we are currently looking at several projects involving solar plus storage in underserved communities. Um, one is with wind companies, which you'll be hearing about a little bit later in the, uh, in the webinar. We also have a community solar project uh, in New York um, that will also include storage. And then we have a combination project, which is community solar plus EV charging infrastructure plus storage. Um, so we have some exciting developments. Um, a lot of these transactions, uh, the economics are um, impacted to a large degree by incentives, 
So we're going to start today talking about incentives and what's available in New York. Next slide. So there are two major ways solar plus storage is incentivized in New York. Most of you are familiar with the basic um, incentive framework for solar, but I'm gonna focus more on the storage side or the combination of storage uh, in addition to solar. Uh, the first way that um, solar plus storage is incentivized is through upfront payments for storage. You'll see on this slide um, a summary of the payments available in New York State. So at the top of the page, you'll see incentives uh, for commercial installations, and it's really broken down by region. So the first two regions are Long Island and Westchester County. Uh, both of them are still working on their first round of incentives. Westchester is at $250 a kWh, and West, I'm sorry, Long Island at $250 a kWh, and Westchester at $175. Uh, both of those programs still have plenty of capacity left. New York City uh, has been through its first round and has almost completed its second round of incentives, and, is and NYSERDA is expected to, reduce, uh, to introduce a new round of incentives shortly. Um, the rates uh, in the first round were $300. Uh, current round is $240. And as I said, the current round is almost entirely subscribed. And then for the rest of the state, uh, there's currently not an incentive program in effect for upfront payments, um, but you can see the effects of uh, four prior rounds of uh, incentives. On the residential side, uh, the one jurisdiction to focus on is Long Island, where there's currently an upfront payment of $250 per kWh, uh, and that's approximately half subscribed. So these are things that um, NYSERDA is looking at, uh, NYSERDA and New York State more broadly has a plan for increasing the amount of storage, so stay tuned on all these fronts. Next slide, please. The second major way uh, that storage is incentivized in New York is through the VEDA rate, or the value of distributed energy resources. Now, this gets a little bit complicated for those of you who aren't familiar with the VEDA rate, um, so I'm going to just touch on some of the high points here. And the VEDA rate is not meant specifically to uh, incentivize storage. Rather, the VEDA rate represents a new way of pricing energy uh, that reflects a lot of the costs and benefits more accurately and was part of the reforming the energy vision. Uh, I'm going to touch on the parts that are relevant to the storage discussion. So for commercial solar or standalone storage projects, the bill credits for selling it are set VEDA rate. The VEDA rate is the sum of a few value stack components. One is the locational-based marginal pricing, which is based on the New York ISO rate, capacity, environmental value, and locational adders, and then a demand reduction value, or DRV. Adding storage to a commercial solar project can increase the VEDA compensation by capturing more DRV and more capacity value. So, said if you're putting storage in an area that is capacity constrained, where it's difficult to get the full um, deliveries from the grid, that storage is worth a lot more, so bill credits are compensated at a higher level. The DRV values and hours where compensated depends on the utility and the load characteristics in that area. It's payable during certain times of day that represent that area's highest demand periods. So what does that all mean? Say, for example, in New York City, in a Con Ed business district, peak demand may be midday or in the afternoon, say 11 to 3 or 2 to 6. Or in a Con Ed residential district, let's assume uh, Westchester County, for example, or more residential parts of New York City, peak demand may be later in the day, from 4 to 8 or from 7 until 11. By adding storage, a solar project can capture more of that revenue. For example, a solar project without storage in a 7 to 11 DRV area may receive almost no DRV revenues because it's unable to supply energy at that time. So 7 to 11 is the time when the grid has the most demands for energy, and that's a time when almost no solar energy is being produced. But if that same project has storage and can capture energy midday during maximum solar output, and can discharge that energy into the grid between 7 to 11, it can capture significant DRV revenues. 
So in addition to the upfront payments, being able to take advantage of the pricing structure of the VEDA rate is very advantageous in driving the economics of solar. We can see that just the capturing of DRV and capacity move the economics by several cents a kilowatt hour. And again, it depends on the service territory and the location uh, where the project's being installed. So with that, I'll turn it over to Caitlin Kelly to talk more about what's happening in Massachusetts. Thank you, Curtis. Um, and thank you to the Clean Energy Group for pulling together this great, pan great panel of people to talk about these issues today. Um, I'm primarily going to talk about how solar plus storage um, for low income uh, focused development is incentivized through the SMART program in Massachusetts. The SMART program stands for the Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target. Um, it's an, an tariff based incentive program, um, and we have a, a number of different ways that we uh, incentivize these types of projects. Next slide. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the SMART program, um, it is a, um, as I mentioned, a tariff-based incentive program with a declining block structure. So the intent is to provide an incentive for solar and solar plus storage um, while continuing to bring costs down uh, to reduce rate payer impact for supporting the continued growth of this industry and this market. Uh, the way that the rate is determined is by the size of the PV project um, and the electric distribution company service territory that it's located in. Um, so we have essentially a basic rate that's established based on the size. And then we offer additional incentives that we call adders um, based on a certain amount of incentive per kilowatt hour. Uh, and we offer adders for specific types of projects um, under a couple different iterations for low income incentives. And then we also have an adder specifically geared toward um, PV that is co-located with battery storage. Next slide. So under the program, we offer, uh, we actually differentiate incentives um, based on the size of the, of the project. So we have a section of the program that's aimed towards small projects, uh, mainly the residential sector. Um, we don't identify it as such, but any project that is um, 25 kilowatts or less, um, it, it's majority uh, a residential installation. And under the program, we actually offer um, a base rate for a project that's serving a low income customer that's a small project um, that's 30% higher um, than the, uh, the rate that we would otherwise offer to the same size project that's not low income. So we, we increase the total amount that they are receiving. Um, for large projects, which we identify large as any project that's over 25 kW, um, up to five megawatts, um, we have a number of different adders. So we have a community shared solar adder that is um, available for those projects that are serving low income customers through community shared solar. And in order to be eligible, essentially half of the customers served in the community shared solar project have to be low income. We also have what we call a low income property adder. Um, so that's three cents a kilowatt hour. Low income property is if you have a project that is mainly uh, serving a, a housing authority, or if it's serving um, a not you know a nonprofit low income housing development such as those uh, built and managed by Win, uh, for instance, that that would be eligible for what we call the low income property adder. And we identify low income off takers um, in a couple of different ways. Uh, we actually just expanded our eligibility for. Uh, what constitutes an eligible low-income customer. Um, so any residential customer that is on a utility electric rate that's specifically geared toward low-income customers, so it's a, a discounted utility rate. Um, it's called uh, R2 oftentimes in Massachusetts. They are an eligible low-income customer. Um, we also expanded the eligibility, and any resident that lives in an area that can be identified as 
environmental justice and that meets the income eligibility portion of the environmental justice definition in Massachusetts. If you serve that residential customer, they are el an eligible low income customer. Next slide. And then under SMART, we also offer an adder for paired battery storage. And um, the storage adder is unique in that it is available to projects of all sizes. Um, most of our other projects are only available to uh, systems over 25 kW, that large category of systems. Um, but we really, in Massachusetts, we have, uh, we recognize the value of energy storage. Um, it is one of our main priorities, um, you know, across multiple policy areas. So we we see the value of encouraging energy energy storage for residential installations as well as commercial um, and industrial scale installations. And the way that we calculate the adder is uh, it's actually it it looks like a complex formula. Um, basically. It's looking at the size of the, the battery compared to the PV system and then how long the battery can operate for. And so it, it's a variable rate. So uh, we created a, a calculator um, that's available on our website to assist in figuring out what incentive might be available for different uh, project types and project designs. Um, but just to give you an example, uh, if you have a four megawatt PV system that's paired with a two megawatt uh, battery. If that battery has a three hour duration, then you are eligible to receive basically a four and a half cent adder per kilowatt hour. If that battery is six hours, then your incentive will go up and you're eligible to receive uh, 5.8 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And we also have a number of operational and technical requirements to remain eligible for the adder. Um, you know, it's mainly, we want to make sure that the battery is being operated and run. So it's a fairly simple, uh, you have to cycle it about once a week per year. Um, we also want to make sure that you're discharging the battery uh, during peak hours. So are you discharging it during the identified summer and winter peak hours? Um, We've also made some uh, changes to those uh, requirements. And we have said, for instance, if you are participating in um, a utility run demand response program, then you will remain eligible and satisfy the operational requirements for the energy storage adder. Um, so it, like, we really had a lot of discussion and um, refinements to the, the broad policy for interconnecting um, PV plus battery storage in Massachusetts over the past couple of years. It's a, it's a highly complicated subject, um, but our goals are to encourage more PV paired with battery storage um, and also to make sure that those batteries are being utilized in a way that not only provides benefits to customers, but also provides um, grid facing benefits um, for everybody. Next slide, please. So this um, is based off of our current qualified and operational projects in the SMART program in Massachusetts. And so I broke it out between essentially that large and small category type. So as you can see, we are making improvements on, you know, encouraging more energy storage projects, encouraging more low income projects. Um, one of our main points of focus in the most recent revision to the SMART program was uh, really seeing what we could do to improve our policies to encourage more, more of those types of systems. But, as you can see, we're, you know, the numbers are still smaller for low income and projects that are PV plus storage. Um, so the way that we've designed the program, you know, we focus on, uh, you know, we have these adders, you can, you can 
as the name implies, add them up on top of each other. Um, so, you know, obviously there are challenges with implementing both energy storage policies and, and, and separately low income policies. Um, so we have made uh, a lot of, we've done a lot of work to improve um, the availability of those incentives and the accessibility of those incentives, but uh, we're continuing to prioritize these goals. Uh, you know, in addition to the SMART program, the SMART program is the primary incentive for solar plus storage in Massachusetts. Um, but we also just launched our Clean Peak program, uh, which is aimed at distributed resources that can help reduce uh, system wide peak. So if you have a PV paired with battery storage, then it is also eligible for Clean Peak because if you're in, in participating in SMART, then the Clean Peak certificates for the PV portion um, may not go to the system owner, it'll likely go to the utility, um, but you can reclaim the Clean Peak certificates for the, the associated battery. So as I said, this is an ongoing conversation um, across many different parts of um, you know, the government, the DPU, DOER, uh, as well as work that the utilities continue to do. Um, so we know we have more work to do, but we have made uh, a lot of strides uh, to make this more accessible. And now I'm going to pass things off to Emily Jones. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, I'm Emily Jones. I'm from LISC uh, in Boston, and I'll be speaking about uh, solar and storage specifically in affordable housing uh, today. Next slide, please. So uh, LISC is one of the nation's largest uh, community development financial institutions, and my colleague Thomas Mitchell will speak a little bit more to um, the comprehensive nature of the work that we support. The Green Retrofit uh, Initiative or the Green Homes Project was actually started uh, about a decade ago to support affordable housing owners in accessing our then new uh, LEAN program, which is the state's uh, the utility programs um, and energy efficiency program. Since then, we've, we've learned there's deep savings, uh, energy and water savings uh, opportunities available in uh, for affordable housing owners uh, and also opportunities to transition to clean and resilient energy, which uh, you know includes solar and storage. But there's both technical, there's financial, there's knowledge barriers that um, that we are supporting owners in in uh, really getting over to implement some of these goals. Next slide, please. So these are uh, five of the promising practices that we really uh, support. We have owners think about as they're reviewing their entire portfolio and thinking about if they want to go to solar, where do they start? Next slide, please. So the first is benchmarking the portfolio. So benchmarking, we um, it's tracking your progress on, um, on your energy and water use in, in your portfolio. And really, this is where it all starts, right? You can't manage what you don't measure. Uh, we uh, support owners in using WeGoWise, which is one of many different benchmarking platforms. There's also Bright Powers Energy Scorecards, EPA's Free Portfolio Manager. Um, and owners were coming to us say, saying that they wanted to go solar across their portfolio. And so we said, you know, that's great. How can we work backwards from there? And um, you can track your progress on where you are, where you want to go, and whether you've utilized some of the, the programs that Caitlin has uh, mentioned, as well as the energy efficiency programs available in, in, the, in the state here. Uh, these benchmarks are uh, designed for both new and new buildings and existing buildings. And it, it allows you to put in where your rehab, when your anticipated rehab date is, um, which I'll speak to in the next slide. Next slide, please. Yep. So uh, this is, so auditing, what, what we've learned over the past 10 years is that owners really um, don't necessarily want uh, additional debt in between capital cycles. And so the best time to achieve a deeper energy and water savings and think about clean energy technology, such as solar plus storage, is really at this magical moment of refinancing, which in affordable housing uh, occurs about every 15 years. So um, 
we recommend that owners on the 15 year, as they're approaching rehab for each, each of their properties, that they get an ASHRAE level two, or what's a, called a comprehensive energy audit for their property, in addition to the traditional conference uh, capital needs assessment. So what the audit does is it allows you to identify which of your properties may be well positioned for deeper energy and water savings investments, as well as clean energy tech. Um, you can see here on the slide is a, one of the properties that were audited with a building science partner, New Ecology, and, um, and seeing that there was solar plus storage potential here uh, on that site. So uh, if they do, if there's an audit, we, we support these audits uh, for affordable housing owners in Massachusetts. And if they do identify that they're promising property for solar, uh, then and solar and storage, then we will have, uh, we'll partner with Clean Energy Group to have um, that owner undergo a solar plus storage feasibility assessment and kind of go deeper and, and find out what the, what the promise is there. Uh, I'll also say that our Clean Energy Center here in Massachusetts, Mass, C, Mass CEC, has uh, good resources on their website to help you think about how you go from this idea of solar to really comparing apples to apples bids. Um, and then just lastly about the audits, this is always best uh, your best position to take advantage of all of the recommended measures if you get it about a year and a half in advance of your property's rehab timeline. Next slide, please. So uh, once you have a comprehensive energy audit for your property, we encourage owners to maximize all these great uh, energy efficiency and clean energy programs that we have here in, in Massachusetts. So um, I've mentioned the LEAN program, that's the low income multifamily arm of the Mass Save Utility Energy Efficiency Program. Uh, Caitlin has mentioned the, the SMART program for solar and also the commun uh, Connected Solutions Program for solar plus storage here in Massachusetts. So um, I'll, I'll add here that owners really benefit from predictable programs, programs that have adequate incentives, um, and, and guidance for the best systems for their building, and then assurance of high quality vendors uh, to make informed decisions. Next slide, please. So fourth, we recommend that owners uh, really, uh, that they ask their permanent lenders to offer financing that recognizes that they're building and retrofitting to higher performance standards. So MHP, one of our housing finance agency partners here in Massachusetts, now offers permanent first mortgage financing for um, that's preferential for green and healthy housing certifications, as well as green retrofits that, that achieve at least a 30% combined energy and water savings potential. So this is really exciting um, advances. Um, there's also offered in, in CPC, you'll see there on the slide, their underwriting efficiency manual, they developed some really fantastic resources, a community preservation corporation out of New York to help uh, investors start to standardize this underwriting of anticipated um, higher performance systems in buildings. There's also uh, opportunities for power purchase agreements or other financing that, that some of the other panelists will speak to in between capital cycles so that owners can take advantage of some of these clean energy technologies like solar and storage. Next slide, please. So lastly, we really think it's critical to obviously monitor um, these systems long-term, commission them and train staff so that they feel uh, comfortable with, with continuing to optimize the performance of, of these systems as anticipated. Um, as I mentioned, some owners aren't interested in ownership because of maintenance concerns. Even if you're doing a PPA, however, we do recommend that, um, that there is monitoring performance uh, software contracts in place to really make sure that, that these systems are, are being optimized for, for the long term. More broadly, uh, LISC is committed to uh, advocating for, to supporting the affordable housing sector's increased access to solar and storage and other clean energy tech through exploring opportunities for statewide solarized for affordable housing campaigns uh, with our partners at Resonant Energy, a uh, solar B core company, and by uh, advocating for increased funding at the state and utility energy efficiency program levels for more clean, clean energy tech access such as solar and storage investments and for equitable green building workforce development training. 
so thanks and I think that's it for me and I'll turn it back over to Seth to speak a little more about some of the technical considerations for promising practices. Thank you, Emily. And um, I don't have any slides to accompany my, my portion here, but I just wanted to talk more generally before we turn things over to, to Christina at Wynn about, um, you know, what we've seen over the years. Clean Energy Group has been working in the um, uh, solar and storage space for, for underserved communities for, for over six years now, about, about seven years. Um, and we have worked to help facilitate um, at least exploration, exploration exploration and assessment of, of uh, about 200 properties across the United States. Um, and a lot of the projects that have um, come together have, have done so for a number of reasons. Um, you know, when, when projects first approach us, they usually are looking at one of two objectives. One is, of course, savings, and that's so usually the driving factor. The other is uh, energy resilience, so backup power um, for folks that have um, been a part of, of climate disruptions or expecting to experience more disruptions to power supply. Uh, the, the driving factors for the economic side has a lot to do with incentives um, and, and has historically had a lot to do with incentives which you've heard are available in both New York and Massachusetts. Um, California really started that with, with their energy storage incentive program. Um, a lot of it is on the storage side, solar um, with net metering, it really just pencil out in a lot of places without a whole lot of uh, incentives. Although um, to reach low income markets, um, there still is a great need for, for incentives. The other driving factor for economics on, on the energy storage side has been demand charges, which um, typically only commercial customers have. And these are charges per kilowatt instead of per kilowatt hour. So instead of consumption, it's, it's how much energy you are using all at the same time. Um, and those have been, really been a driving factor for demand charges. Uh, New York has high demand charges. These are, we're talking about uh, upwards of say $30 per kilowatt in some instances. Uh, Massachusetts does as well as does, does California. Uh, but an issue has been that a lot of the, the facilities serving uh, lower income communities, such as affordable housing or community centers, don't have really spiky demand. They, they have pretty level demand throughout the day. and it makes demand charge management, um, making revenue, generating bill savings through managing demand a, a difficult prospect for energy storage. And usually the system sizes you get are not the kinds that can also provide something like real significant um, energy resilience for, for critical loads at a facility, which is why it's so important that places like New York and Massachusetts are starting to shift in, in how their, their programs are designed. Uh, Massachusetts in particular, we've done a lot of work helping to get here, Connected Solutions Program established, which is really a, a demand response program that, that acts through the state efficiency funds. And uh, Christina will talk more about the economics of that for, for wind properties. But what it does is instead of just looking at the demand for an individual property where um, if you don't have spiky demand, uh, the economic storage may not work well. And that's often industrial customers or, or folks that have big things like water pumping needs or, or big equipment that shuts off on and off. Um, what the uh, Connected Solutions Program does and other programs like it is it looks at system-wide demand. So the, the demand across the whole energy system to be able to lower demand for utilities to, to call on these and really reduce their need to tap into things like expensive peak power plants um, that are polluting resources and, and very expensive to start up and run. Instead, they call on these distributed energy storage systems have those discharge, offset local demand, and lower demand on the system so they don't have to fire up expensive power plants. And it creates a uh, economic opportunity for everyone across the system, not just folks that are um, that have specific high demand utility rate structures um, or have spiky demand and needs. So, and it ends up lowering the cost of delivering electricity to everyone instead of just lowering them for one specific system. So. We have seen projects that have penciled out, but they're starting to become more and more viable without deep incentives, without grant support from uh, foundations or, or federal or state grant programs, um, and starting to see battery systems that can provide both economic returns and significant resilience benefits because of the prevalence of these new programs where the utilities are, are calling on batteries to make projects work. So. Um, you know, I, I'm going to leave it off there. I think 
um, just on the technology side, uh, just to kind of level set for folks, you know, usually we're talking about lithium ion batteries um, for these systems, things like Tesla battery systems. Um, we have plenty more information about that. If, if you'd like, we're releasing a report tomorrow. Um, we'll include that in, in the materials we send out after this, along with the recording. But uh, for folks that would like to learn more about the, the technical side, that will have more, and I'm not going to get too into that right now. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Christina at Wind Companies to talk about the work that they're doing specifically with, with some of their projects. Thanks, Seth, and thanks um, Clean Energy Group for putting this together and, and inviting uh, me to present. Um, Christina McPike, I'm the Director of Energy and Sustainability at Wind Companies. Uh, next slide. Wind Companies is a 50-year-old family founded and, and operated real estate company. We're a developer, we're a long-term owner, and we're a management company. We're the, actually the largest manager of affordable housing in the country. We manage about 120,000 units in 23 states in DC. Um, Wynn owns a, about 10% of those properties um, and self-manages those properties, all in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast regions. For 15 plus years, Wynn has had, um, as one of its guiding principles, um, a commitment to sustainability. Next slide. Um, we actually have an in-house sustainability team, myself and two colleagues included, um, a small but mighty Wind Green team. Um, as a team, we implement uh, Wind's commitment to sustainability. And as we know, sustainability um, you know, is a broad, far-reaching umbrella, which makes our, our jobs really fun. But I wanted to just mention quickly that we really have a strong track record that we're, we're really proud of. Um, over the last decade, we've invested more than $30 million in energy efficiency and water conservation projects across our own portfolio, as well as our managed, um, you know, fee managed sites. Um, we are, are definitely a leader in solar development. We've developed and invested in three megawatts of solar in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and DC, where we actually developed what was at the time the largest community renewable energy facility or CREF. Um, project in the district, about 650 kilowatts um, on one of our properties in Southeast DC. Um, we, we really see ourselves as sort of uh, ahead of the pack and, and like to be leaders of the pack. We, we try to push the envelope wherever we can, quite literally in the case of you know, recent efforts around deep energy retrofits and, and zero overtime planning. Um, as a company, we are, we are trying and actively thinking about and evaluating um, our decarbonization goals and the decarbonization goals um, in the states that we operate in. So it makes a lot of sense that we're, we're uh, rolling up our sleeves on the, the solar plus storage front, educating ourselves really. Um, I'd say we're still pretty early in the process, um, but are, are really excited to be participating on this panel, but also really behind the scenes working with most everyone on this panel to try to figure out real projects and, and get them implemented. Um, 2020 is a blur, but I think it was at the beginning of this year that we really engaged um, with uh, CEG and with some financial support from them, we're able to partner with American Microgrid Solutions. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about our work with AMS over the last a handful of months on um, a feasibility analysis of a portion of our portfolio. Next slide. So like I mentioned, Wynn has a large portfolio, 90 properties, roughly six states. That's uh, a few dozen utility companies in different markets. Um, with AMS, we quickly whittled that down to you know, 23 properties in four states. Still probably too much to, to chew off initially. Um, and really unsurprising and, and, and sort of indicative or a testament to the leadership in Massachusetts and the new programs that are that are still evolving, um, but, but critical, we landed in Massachusetts specifically. Um, so our feasibility analyses with AMS have focused specifically on about a half dozen properties all in Massachusetts, um, and not so coincidentally actually on our historic mill buildings. Not exactly a representative building type for that many owners, but, but we have uh, quite a few of these buildings in our own portfolio they lend themselves well to the analysis and that they have large expansive roofs. These are um, large grandiose buildings with a lot of glazing. And um, you know, nine times out of 10, they in our portfolio have central plants. So meaning a, a cooling tower, a chiller, a big boiler plant, putting all of the heating and cooling load on the, on the house meters and the landlord meter. Meaning we, the building owner, our limited partners, see that expense um, and, and, and their bottom line. Um, 
most of these properties that we selected with AMS are also serving elderly residents and therefore um, you know, a, a more vulnerable population that we're um, really prioritizing and uh, our resiliency efforts towards. Um, these sites fall into sort of two camps, National Grid and Eversource, the two sort of main utility providers in Massachusetts. Um, you don't often hear owners um, praising high, uh, high energy costs. Um, I will now because it, it makes energy projects work a lot better. Um, so, you know, Seth and others have, have said, you know, we don't have super peaky, super high demand charges, and that's true. Um, but it does make up a pretty significant portion of, of the buildings that we selected for this particular project. Um, these are actual screenshots from a, a couple of buildings that we're looking at, and and you know our demand usage isn't isn't huge. It's 50 to 100 kW maybe per month, and we're paying 10 dollars a kilowatt hour, or a kilowatt rather, sorry, um, for those. So those kinds of factors are really important as we as we sort of screen our portfolio and select projects and prioritize projects with the goal of trying to find the, the real the best sort of strongest contenders um, for early demonstration efforts. Um, others have alluded to it, but I, I'll reiterate as I go on, the, the incentive programs, availability, the confidence in them, the value of them are key. Um, and that's both connected solutions and, and the smart incentive for solar plus the storage adders. Um, Again, we started with with this this broader group of buildings, and on on average, you know, some of them didn't pencil at all. Some of them look pretty good. These returns are um, unleveraged, seven to nine percent IRRs. Um, interestingly, you know, we looked at some buildings that already have solar but not storage, asking the question of sort of can we capitalize on that investment that's already happened? And frankly, the numbers didn't look so great. And we asked a similar question of, well, we know how to build solar, we, we do it a lot. Um, and those numbers are, are looking a little bit more attractive than solar plus storage at first pass. But, it's a big but, they don't offer resiliency and they miss out on some of the um, clean energy sort of larger grid impacts that we're looking to contribute toward in terms of carbon savings. Um, next slide. I'm gonna hone in now on one specific project that is, um, again, this is this feasibility screening um, with AMS, um, as well as CEG and NYSEQ for that matter, is, is still a work in progress. These are preliminary numbers, but we have one, one strong project that's looking um, attractive and, and that we're particularly optimistic and excited about. This is um, Clifftex Mill in New Bedford, Massachusetts, um, south of Boston. In this image, you'll see this, this, this long building and half of it has windows and half of it's boarded up. Um, so we developed the first phase of this project about 10 years ago. It's 70 units of low income elderly housing in a, in a beautiful old mill building. You'll actually notice that we, we sort of snuck 50 kW of solar in the back um, out of sight from uh, historic preservation, which was relevant at the time. Uh, the building is now outside of its historic um, tax credit compliance period. Um, I, I chose to show both phases here because um, we actually have a discussion about sort of how to figure out integrating solar and storage up front in new construction. We'll be building 70 additional apartments in phase two of the project starting next year and, and really you know, going out um, to 2022. Um, and without knowing the, the load profile and the building specifics, it makes it really difficult to, to model. Um, so we've, we've narrowed it down specifically to phase one of the project, a building that's been occupied. Um, we have data on, it's, it's you know, in our portfolio and we know it um, like the back of our hands. Um, and AMS has, has done preliminary screening and come up with um, a 220 kW solar array that's covering the phase one roof only, including that clear story, um, and uh, a 60 kW battery. This is the, the kind of economic best case scenario, um, favoring savings to the site and to the owner investor, um, not necessarily sizing the battery for, um, you know, sort of peak, bad term, but for, for optimal maybe resiliency benefits, which I'll get into in a second. Um, the total capex of this specific project at this point, again, numbers numbers are moving, um, $675,000. About two thirds of that is for solar, one third um, for the battery. And I've listed here 
a number and it's not even exhaustive um, of the input that you'll see going into the model that that really supports that capex so this is the investment tax credit formerly at 30 percent now at 26 percent and declining in 2021 an important moving piece that that could make and break a project um, obviously the smart incentives and the connected solutions incentives um, absolutely critical to um, to the cash flow to the deal the smart incentives are are 20 year incentives um, which which is really aligns and complements the the useful life of the equipment um, the connected solutions incentive um, is a five-year term um, so we are having some challenges in navigating that and understanding really what we can project in year six and beyond understanding that the battery has you know a, a useful life and, and needs beyond year five um, also very relevant are operating savings to the building owner really what is a building owner if a third party were to come in and own this system um, getting out of it um, so on a, in terms of a cost savings uh, opportunity for this specific system and design, moderate demand savings at $1,500 per year. It's a conservative estimate, again, um, modeled and estimated at this stage. The solar will produce 30, over $30,000 of worth of electricity that the site would otherwise be paying from Eversource. You know, if third party owned, there would be a PPA or a lease agreement, and it would be some portion of that, um, of that value um, offsetting the owner's otherwise, you know, uh, electricity cost. Um, all of those are, are, are calculable um, inputs and, and numbers that, that can make these deals work. And, and frankly, they are making the deals work. What's less clear and known, and is still a challenge that, that we're working through and excited to have support from my other panelists to help figure out, is valuing resiliency. It, it comes at an added cost. So this 60 kW battery is offering uh, uh, about 14 hours of backup power for about 15% of the critical load. So that might be a community room with lighting and, and plug loads and refrigerator and a heat pump for heating and cooling for 14 hours. Um, so the next questions as we go into um, reviewing this and modeling this is, what if we want that to be 72 hours or 24 hours? How does that impact the size of the battery in the total capex? And all the other numbers that are in the model, and and it has a big impact. There, are, you know, transfer switches and critical load panels, additional infrastructure costs that have to be considered, and so we're we're um, you know sort of smack dab in the middle of of figuring that out. And it's new, and it's I think questions that any building owner is going to to ask and and sort of grapple with um, as as we move through the sort of early adopters and um, pilot projects. Next slide. Uh, I, I wanted to end on um, sort of reiterating that we're scratching the surface. Um, we're really lucky in that we have, you know, really our team in-house and the support from CEG and the support from AMS and the interest and potential, um, you know, relationship with NYSEQ, um, offering really strong financing. And the, you know, a le leveraged project that 9% IRR is double or triple in, um, at this point. So, uh, you know, real and, and appealing for sure. Um, but there's there's a lot of you know work left to do. Um, so I broke it up into some categories here, but um, sort of on the technical side, maybe unsurprisingly, but surprising to me, we didn't have um, access to any interval data. So we just installed a data logger on the building's main service that will give us five minute um, real time electric electric use data. Right now, all of the modeling and assumptions are that really inform the sizing of the system are, are based on total monthly KWH usage. Um, we think getting the interval data is going to um, help inform the modeling and hone in on the really the project optimization and ultimately the cost and the benefits and, and give us some, some greater certainty in, in the return and the cash flow of the project. Um, we're, like I mentioned, working on valuing resiliency. How do you put a dollar, uh, you know, cost or value on hours off of the grid or without power? Um, how do you select if 14 hours is okay or 72 hours is okay? Um, it's a different way of of thinking about backup power, very different from, uh, you know, your your diesel or natural gas um, generator, which is what we'd like to get away from and really try to help uh, uh, crack the nut on, I guess. Um, 
you know, issues around the ITC uh, and, and whether or not there's a future tax credit for battery storage. These are things that are sort of moving pieces and parts and, and super critical to projects penciling. Um, connected solutions, like I mentioned, at this point, you know, is five years. We, we really want to know um, what can we do to, um, you know, understand if and how those incentives may extend in year six and beyond. Um, and we'll continue to explore with with AMS and, and with NYSEEK the different uh, financial opportunities and, and tools that are available to us to finance this. Um, when often, you know, we often um, self-finance and develop most of the solar that we have in our portfolio, we'd be interested in doing that here. But there's also a lot of, you know, strong reasons and values in entertaining a third party ownership structure. Um, so those are things that are sort of all still in the works. Um, you know, despite that, we're actually well underway in working through the interconnection application, um, sort of uh, representing that, that we're, we're serious and we want to see the project move forward. What we don't know is if and how including storage in the IA process could, you know, look different or impact things differently than if it was a solar only interconnection application. So we're eager to learn how the, how smoothly smoothly that goes. Um, and as we, you know, get better data and hone in on the project specifics, we are, you know, working basically as an owner and in-house team on figuring out how to make the best pitch. Um, how do you make this appealing and make a lot of sense to owners and recognizing that we're a, a for-profit, you know, fee-motivated owner. Um, and we, like most owners, you know, need to see the, the economic return on, a, on an investment like this. Um, at first pass in these initial conversations, uh, including those with, with NYSEEK and um, as we work through the system design with American Microgrid Solutions, we're really optimistic, um, excited for the future of, of storage in Massachusetts, specifically at this at this point. And um, you know, I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. But um, wanted to just reiterate that um, we're grateful for CEG's leadership here, and um, as well as DOERs. I think with that, I'm passing it off to Thomas at LISC's New York City office. Great, thanks, Christina, um, and thanks to the CEG folks for um, you know hosting this panel this afternoon. Um, so uh, my name is Thomas Mitchell. I'm a senior community development officer uh, with the local office of LISC in New York City. Um, we've talked a little bit about the incentives landscape and uh, evaluating projects from the owner perspective, really. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, you know, the viewpoint of uh, LISC as a mission-driven lender. Um, you know, why this connects to LISC's mission and why we're interested in, um, you know, both investing in and supporting solar and storage projects. Uh, and I do my best to keep it brief here and leave some uh, time for us to answer questions that the folks on the line might have. Um, so next slide. Um, a little bit about LISC to start. Um, I know Emily jumped right into her end of the um, presentation. So I wanted to share some context uh, on LISC. Uh, LISC, the National Local Initiative Support Corporation, is really kind of at its core an intermediary of it. that's bridging the gap between underinvested communities and the organizations that serve those communities and a whole variety of you know, government, private, philanthropic resources and really trying to um, bring those two together. Uh, so LISC, like uh, my colleague Emily mentioned, is a CDFI, a community development financial institution, one of the largest ones uh, in the country. So, you know, the primary thing that we do there is provide financing. But as you heard from Emily, we also offer a lot of technical assistance and programming and support for our partners. Um, LISC has 36 local offices across the country, I think is the, uh, the latest number, in addition to um, a rural program that serves uh, the entire country. And then you know, we also have affiliates that are operating as low-income housing tax credit syndicators uh, in the SBA lending space with new markets tax credits and various other financing um, sources. And LISC is really active in a huge uh, range of areas. I think most folks that know LISC think of LISC in the affordable housing space, um, but LISC is also supporting a variety of programs and. Uh, economic development, education, um, financial stability, 
healthy community, safety and justice, um, kind of across the board in all of those, um, you know, the local markets that we work in. Uh, but really central to all of that activity is working with community-based partners and organizations, um, you know, to, like I mentioned, bring them the, the, the resources they need to do their work. Uh, next slide. So I guess, you know, getting into specifically List New York City and, um, you know, what that means for our programming. List New York City is one of those um, 36 local offices that I mentioned. Uh, LISC itself was founded in New York City and is based in New York City. Um, and you'll see here on this slide that a lot of the specific focus areas of LISC New York City really mirror those of our, um, our national program. And, you know, between affordable housing, economic development, workforce development, and health equity, um, our lending platform and the lending work we do is really intended to uh, Go over all those areas and support them all in a variety of ways. Um, and really how we came to um, looking at solar projects and seeing solar press storage as an area that um, LISC in New York City wants to be investing in is that it's really easy to see the overlap between the solar plus storage opportunity and you know these four primary areas we work in. Um, you know, in affordable housing, obviously reducing energy costs, both for tenants to the extent possible, um, but also, you know, improving, uh, you know, the sustainability of projects and the margins of a lot of the nonprofit um, owners and operators of affordable housing in New York City that we serve is really important to us. Um, you know, working with those community-based organizations to um, develop and maintain affordable housing in New York City is kind of, uh, where the List New York City program got its start. Um, and they're kind of under significant um, significant pressure. And so we're always looking for ways to help those nonprofit owner op operators, um, you know, improve their operations with um, solar and storage being one opportunity to do that. Uh, on the economic and workforce development um, front, we really see, um, this has been a growth area for LISC New York City. Um, and we see big opportunities here um, with this growing market to support the creation and growth of minority owned businesses, new accessible jobs and you know, installers, technical consultants, what have you, and kind of all of the income and wealth building opportunities that go along with that for um, low income individuals and um, residents of those communities. So that's an important um, area of overlap for us as well. And is really something that we're looking at when we're looking at specific projects. Um, and the last one is health equity. And really our health equity work um, so far has been focused around partnering with housing organizations and healthcare providers to look at ways to make their housing healthier for residents in terms of um, reducing mold and things like that and improving um, indoor air quality to the extent that that benefits um, residents and reduces asthma rates and things like that. And we really see the solar plus storage opportunity as a way to deepen that impact. Um, you know, having the storage aspect, being able to eliminate peaker plants in New York City um, would go a long way toward that. And, you know, we also see, of course, a connection to um, resiliency um, and disaster preparedness and um, a lot of communities in New York City, um, you know, have been impacted by that. And those natural disasters really systematically impact the communities of color that we're trying to serve. And so, um, you know, that's how we draw that connection between solar plus storage and our work in the health equity. Um, space. So that's kind of how it connects to our program areas. The next thing I kind of wanted to touch on is really how does LISC view, um, view these type of projects from the lender perspective? Uh, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, we're new to this space. Uh, we come to it from a bit of a different angle than uh, our friends at NICE do in that you know, our, our mission is really focused on supporting communities and we're looking to see how 
solar projects can uh, can further that work. Um, but in a lot of ways, it mirrors our overall approach to all of the financing we offer, which is really patience, flexibility, and partnership. And so, um, you know, the projects that we've looked at today, both in New York City and in talking to my colleagues across the country, have really been um, long-term projects that LISC has been involved in from the beginning, starting with helping our partners evaluate the feasibility of projects, um, you know, all the way through the financing of them and the eventual operation of them. And, you know, across all those, um, you know, folks on the LISC team I've talked to that have been involved in these financing, that's really been um, a key, has been the patience to see projects um, through particularly with some of the partners that LISC typically works with that may be smaller organizations that are operating, you know, a single building or a small portfolio um, and need a lot of support along the way. And, you know, LISC, while we're offering financing, um, you know, we do standalone technical assistance in a variety of areas. Uh, we like to think of all of our financing um, as coming with a, a healthy dose of that technical assistance as well. Um, so I, I guess I will leave it there in terms of uh, looking at the list New York City perspective on things and pass it off to, or back to, I should say, um, Caitlin Kelly, who's gonna talk a little about, a bit about some other uh, revenue streams and economic drivers. Thanks, Tom. Um, so I don't have any slides for this portion of the conversation, but I just wanted to touch on this briefly. Uh, so part of the reason storage has been such a main priority for Massachusetts in terms of policy in the past couple of years is we really see storage as being an integral tool to the advancement of clean energy resources and distributed energy resources um, on the grid. Uh, we have very uh, aggressive goals for uh, basically making our electric grid more green and clean, and storage is a massive part of that plan, uh, primarily because storage is dispatchable. And so when we're designing our, our policies and when we're working with other stakeholders on issues related to storage, uh, you know, one of the main factors that we thought that we're trying to encourage is for storage resources to really be able to access a number of revenue streams. Um, you know, one of the driving forces in the SMART program um, and just in uh, our incentive policies in general have been to uh, continue to encourage these clean energy resources while bringing cost and ratepayer costs down. And a, an important aspect of that is for these resources to be able to access uh, market-driven revenues in addition to the incentive revenues. So one of the major resources for storage specifically is as accessing the capacity and ancillary services markets. Um, so, you know, we actually do we are work with a number of stakeholders uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, two years ago, to uh, come to a proposal, a, you know, a compromise proposal essentially that was uh, approved by the Department of Public Utilities, where uh, generation unit owners now have the opportunity to uh, buy out capacity rights from interconnected PV resources. And this applies to all net metered resources, this applies to all resources that are interconnected under the SMART program. And that was because, you know, as part of the energy payments that uh, a generator would receive through uh, those uh, programs, uh, the utilities essentially had the, the initial right to those capacity, uh, those capacity rights. And generator owners were saying, you know, we need access to the PV rights in order to really maximize um, the capacity for the battery as well. You know, when the battery is connected to a PV resource, um, you know, it, it it is able to participate in those markets um, in a way that, you know, maybe PV alone can't. Uh, so DWER worked with, uh, as I said, a number of stakeholders through the DPU's process to come to that agreement. So now, 
if uh, you are interested in pursuing uh, participating in those markets, in the ISO markets, uh, there is the option to purchase the capacity rights to the PV so that you can bid in with the PV plus the battery resource in those markets. Um, you know, as was mentioned by a number of speakers on the panel today, obviously the Connected Solutions Program is a great example of how storage can be utilized, um, you know, not in addition to uh, providing resiliency, but also demand response, uh, which again is a, a, a real grid facing benefit. And we amended our uh, program through the SMART program, where if you're participating in Connected Solution, you satisfy the operational criteria uh, to remain eligible for the storage adder. And so really the through line for all of this is it, with PV plus storage, there, you know, there are the actual um, incentives that are offered by, you know, by New York, by Massachusetts, um, you know, Massachusetts, the SMART program, it's Clean Peak. Um, but there are other options for revenue streams. Um, you know, there's peak, there's your own peak shaving. If you if you have a demand charge, um, as Christina was mentioning on um, the housing development that she talked about. Um, and then there are these other ISO markets and opportunities for revenues. So the conversation continues. Um, you know, DOER has been actively involved in a proceeding at the Department of Public Utilities um, with a number of other uh, stakeholders. And it's, you know, we're having very technical and um, it, complicated discussions about not only, um, you know, how can we use these resources? How are they going to be interconnected? And how are the utilities going to study these types of projects? Um, you know, as what happens, you know, as we see more and more of these projects come forward, um, which is what we want to see. Um, and we are working to make the review uh, and the interconnection of those projects, um, you know, as, as streamlined as we can. Um, because, as I said, this is storage really is a an integral tool uh, to achieving our broader goals uh, in Massachusetts, and it it is it is a unique tool in that it truly complements the you know the clean energy resource that it's connected to. Um, you know, in this case, in most most cases, it's solar uh, it provides real resiliency benefits, um, but also grid facing benefits, um, because it's not only uh, and basically that when we have system wide peak on the grid, that's adding costs not only for an individual uh, customer who may be hitting their peak, um, that's that's a cost that's applied to all customers. And there is an opportunity to bring down cost and make the grid itself more resilient uh, with the addition of battery storage. So I think with that, it's back to Seth. Okay, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you to everyone um, for your great presentations. So uh, before I turn it over to the Q&A portion, and we have a lot of questions that have already come in and they're still coming in. Uh, one, this is being recorded and we will share the recording and uh, slides with folks probably tomorrow. We'll get that out to folks. Uh, but two, I just wanted to, to give a big thanks to the Kresge Foundation that has uh, funded the work of Clean Energy Group and IC in, in our work to, to, to advance the financing for um, bringing more solar storage projects and, and underserved communities to, um, to development. Uh, also to the, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, Solar Energy Technologies Office um, through their support of the um, Scaling Up Solar for Under-Resourced under Communities Project, which is also helping to support the webinar today. So with that, I'm going to open things up to questions. I'm going to jump around a little bit um, and try to hit up everybody for, for some answers. So um, folks can uh, show their, their cameras if they want to. I'm going to start with, with Curtis. Um, uh, there was a question just about specifically the the project that NYSEEK has, has involved, been involved in in New York and, and what what incentives incentive programs have helped support those projects either I guess ones that you have worked with already to finance or ones that you're you're currently looking at. 
Yeah, I think it's primarily the um, the NYSERDA incentives that I mentioned, both the upfront payments and then the ability for projects to avail themselves of incremental revenue through um, capacity payments or uh, demand reduction payments using the VEDER tariff. Um, they've been commercial projects. Our focus is CNI and multifamily. We don't do single family residential projects. Um, that's where uh, the interest has been. Uh, historically, there were some other programs that were available. Um, so in B BQDM, Brooklyn Queens Demand Management, um, there were also a series of incentives. Um, those have since been phased out, but uh, NYSERDA has a uh, storage roadmap and has been really good about developing incentives to support this market. Great. Um, Caitlin, there's a question about the, um, the SMART program, the Massachusetts program. Uh, as far as the incentives, do they go directly to the, the solar and storage developers or are there, are there other ways for, for different parties to, to get the incentives directly through the, the SMART program? Uh, so the incentive goes directly to the developers. Um, it's a tariff-based program, so it's it's a payment that's made from the utility companies directly to the the generation unit owners. Great, thank you, um, Emily. Question for you uh, regarding the um, the the performance, the benchmarking. There's just a question about um, what entities you know, help to gather and analyze the data. I know you mentioned new ecology. Can you just speak a little bit to the, the, you know, the types of groups you're working with and um, the, the services that they provide to support that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's different benchmarking softwares that you can use. Some are free. I, I mentioned the EPA, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Um, there's some paid services. We work with uh, WeGoWise for one and Bright Power's Energy Scorecard, but um, they can then, I mean, if it's a paid service, then WeGoWise or Energy Bright Power will help you bring in your data um, from your different utility bills and kind of go through that process so that then you can I identify where your energy savings opportunities are. We also um, do that with our uh, partners that we work with on the, on the audit program. Great. Uh, a few people had a question about resiliency and, and what are we talking about when we're talking about resiliency. Um, Christina went into it to a bit, talking about you know with with battery storage and, and storage paired with renewables and sometimes traditional generators and, and or CHP units. Um, you can actually detach part of uh, a building or or in some cases a whole building from the grid during an outage situation. Um, this is usually a, a fairly seamless project. There's an automatic transfer switch where that happens. Uh, so when we're talking about resiliency, we're actually talking about providing backup power to, to critical loads um, with a building. Uh, I did have one one related question, Christina. You had mentioned the, the costs for the resiliency components. Do you, do you have a sense of kind of the cost premium for resiliency, either for Cliftex or, or other projects? I, I know that can be difficult to answer. Yeah, I, that's definitely still a work in progress. So um, our process, you know, when we first started out with American Microgrid Solutions, we, we were pretty clear in that, um, well, I should say their approach and probably CEG's approach is sort of screening projects in terms of economics, but also resiliency, sustainability, and, and particularly social justice lens. And, and AMS um, really out of the gate sort of asked us to prioritize those, which is, which is difficult to do, but um, I think probably similar to other owners um we we ranked economics first so the first pass um project that that i showed um in the presentation was a kind of economic base case so as the sort of least resiliency um benefit or adder included that still works um and in pencils and sort of uh gives you the best return when we asked the question of well 14 hours for 15 percent of the building load my, that's not enough. You know, what what do we need to get to 24 hours, and then what do we need to get from to 72 hours? And it's basically a bigger battery. Um, so we're going from 60 kW to about over 200 for the 24 hour, and then uh, you know north of 300 for the 72 hour events. Um, so you know that doesn't mean you're doubling and tripling the cost of of the battery. There's there's an incremental cost as you increase the capacity. Um, but I don't, I don't have my, uh, my, my finger on specific numbers, um, but you're paying for a bigger 
more expensive battery and you're paying to, um, you know, in our case where we don't already have a specific space carved out for, you know, a safe room, for example, we would be tying those loads back to an, a new separate panel. And so that's, that's, in my opinion, a minor really electrical infrastructure cost for a new panel, conduit and pulling power. You know, that's not a $50,000 project, um, maybe it's half that. Um, but it's really the cost to go from a 60 kW battery to something that's, you know, three or four times the size of that. Yeah, and I would say, just, you know, just from our experience with projects, I mean, it varies so much that it's really hard to put a, a general terms on that. It can be 10% you know, at or up to, you know, 50% or even 100%. Um, you know, paying for a bigger battery is a huge part of it. Sometimes it can be massive rewiring if the loads that you want to isolate are not already all um within the same general area so they, they it can really vary i'm gonna stick with you um christina just a, a question to the extent that you can i know you said that the the financing side for clipdex is still very much uh work in progress uh but just a question of if you can talk through some of the the things that you're looking at right now like it's what types of lenders you're, you're looking to engage with equity partners leverage um things that to, to those the side of the financing I probably won't get into too much detail there um, because we are really early. Um, we we at this point are talking to NYSEEC um, and, and really only NYSEEC, um, but evaluating it as um, an internal sort of self-financed project where, where one win entity is basically loaning another win entity to develop. So we would create a special purpose entity um, LLC to develop um, and use sort of in, internal equity and and loan to get that project done, um, and it's a, it's a it's a matter of sort of comparing the the cost benefit of that and, and really the the appetite and the return of that scenario, understanding that it's a new technology against um, the offering that that NYSEEC can bring to the table um, or others like NYSEEC, um, you know we work with, um, you know. We've worked with CPC, we've worked with um, uh, Boston Community Capital, I think goes by a different name now, um, uh, Boston Financial, or more traditional uh, partners like that. Um, but I would say it's a big TBD um, right now as we we really need to get the interval data and hone in on the on the modeling results to know what, what costs and benefit we're really talking about. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so a few questions came in uh, just about source of funding for incentives. Um, I don't know, C Curtis or, or Thomas, if you could speak to for for New York City or for New York, um, where the um, the funds are coming from as far as how the, the state is funding the, the incentives for for storage. Yeah, to be honest, um, that's not a piece that I focus on a lot. I assume that it's coming out of uh, collections of system benefits charges um, that are collected by NYSERDA broadly. That's normally how they fund all their grant programs. They have some bonding capacity, but I think this is out of the normal uh, tariff collections. But when you think of, you know, New York State is incredibly peaky in terms of its demand. Um, you know, average capacity utilization in New York is very low because the system has to be built for basically the hottest day in August um, when everybody's running their AC flat out. Um, so storage brings incredible value to the grid. So um, NYSERDA has viewed this as a really as a positive NPV for them um, because getting the storage really um, getting the storage deployed has a huge benefit on grid, both in terms of um, customer savings because you're avoiding peaking expensive peaking resources, but also in terms of um, grid resilience and reliability. Great, actually, Curtis, since I have you here, um, question just came in uh, asking about the, the financing that uh, that uh, Nike offers and just um, you know, where you guys operate uh, geographically. Uh, yeah, our um, our lending territory is from. Massachusetts to Maryland. So it's eight states plus District of Columbia. Um, and we offer a full range of product, products, uh, ESA backed financings or energy services agreement backed financings, PPA backed financings, PACE or property assessed clean energy, um, direct uh, equipment loans. Um, we also offer uh, green mortgages. Um, 
And so we have an ability to offer a whole uh, range of financing products tailored specifically to renewable energy, energy efficiency, or energy storage. Um, you know, as was mentioned during the presentation, ideally you want to finance these at a time when you're doing a refinancing of the mortgage. And that's, uh, you know, there are plenty of lenders. Um, Lisk is a great example um, that are doing the mortgage financing. We tend to focus solely on the um, interim financing solutions, unlike our larger lending um, brethren like uh, like Lisk, who will finance, um, you know, do financing at the uh, you know 15 year cycles in addition to interim financing. Great. Uh, anyway, we're bringing uh, Rob in for this one. Rob, if you're still with us here. Um, it's uh, just saying from, from their understanding that the uh, major hurdle to bring renewables and storage to, to uh, low-income communities and communities of color is a lack of uh, capital in those communities. A question about what kind of financing structures can be employed to bring more capital uh, and more economic control to these communities um, to bring these projects to them and, and give them more opportunities for, for ownership. Well, there are a couple uh, strategies that um that are uh, being explored right now and, and being implemented. Uh, the NYSEQ uh, example is one that was supported considerably by uh, Kresge uh, in establishing a loan guarantee program with uh, grant, uh, companion grants, some for uh, project evaluation um, uh, so that you could determine the feasibility of a project uh, and pay for some of those soft costs. But the the, I think the distinction uh, with the Kresge loan guarantee that NYSEQ is implementing is it's a payment guarantee. And Christine, Christina uh, spoke about the uh, uncertainty of, um, of that you know, attends these, these early uh, solar and storage financings in LMI communities. Uh, what's real risk? What's perceived risk? What, you know, what happens to the connected solutions uh, incentive after after five years, it's, it's likely to be extended, but it's not, it's, it's not been extended at the time that you enter these transactions. Um, so what, what the uh, guarantee program is that NYSEQ is managing is a payment uh, guarantee. It's a maintenance of payments uh, for whatever reason that a debt service related to the solar and storage is not paid. Uh, so it's 50% of the debt service is associated with that. And that's significant, um, and it's on terms that are um, are flexible, and um, and um, I think are, it's a program worth looking at. The other one I just quickly say is that uh, uh, another way to look at this is to try to find similar uh, projects within a portfolio, uh, especially if there's an extensive portfolio. Now uh, evaluate that that portfolio for seeing what the costs would be for implementing um, a series of uh, financings. Um, and then, you know, a structured financing would work uh, to uh, identify what kinds of subsidy incentives, uh, financing, equity investment uh, could be assembled for that. And uh, those efforts are going forth right now as well. Great, thanks, Rob. Um, and while we're, we're talking about, you know, challenges for, for low income programs, uh, Caitlin, I'm wondering if you could speak just from your perspective as a, a state. Uh, state agency, state energy office, you know, some of the challenges that you guys have encountered in, in trying to, to, to craft and implement policies to expand access to, to solar and energy storage among low-income communities. Absolutely. Um, you know, when, you know, for everybody else else's knowledge, we actually had a major revision of the SMART program this past year. Uh, it was built into the original program. We said when we hit 400 megawatts of qualified projects, we would review it. Um, that happened like a month into the program. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of uh, a lot of demand. And, you know, one thing we did was really focus on how could we expand um, low income participation. Um, you know, we even still today, we only have about 3% of uh, the projects that are qualified um, that are serving low-income customers. Um, so, 
I think, you know, based on feedback from stakeholders, there were a couple of obstacles. One was just how do you identify eligible low income customers? Um, so that's why we made the change where we said if you're a resident in an eligible environmental justice area, then that customer is an eligible low income customer. Um, another major obstacle that you know was identified is it, it, part of the reason that low income projects are more difficult to finance. You know, I think particularly we've seen an interest in expanding low income community shared solar uh, is. If you are, you know, normally with community solar, participants have a separate agreement with the project owner. So the project owner is receiving the incentive directly from the utility company, but they are assigning uh, an energy bill credit to a customer that the customer then pays them uh, in exchange for that credit. And there's a difficult uh, exchange and interaction for low income customers. Um, so, Part of the what we've done is basically we said, you know, is there something we could do just into how, you know, how community solar is run? Um, so we have we haven't seen anything um, in operation yet, but you know, we're we're trying to use different methods of reaching those low income customers. So uh, the utility companies have actually, you know, National Grid and EverSource um, have both expressed an interest in running their own type of program um, so basically the customers would sign up directly with them um, you know and developers instead of interacting with customers they're interacting with the utility um, another option that we've had is utilizing um, a program that is very common in massachusetts uh, it's called community choice aggregation basically a city or a town votes to join um, an electricity supply aggregation. So the town signs on with a retail electric supplier. And again, we said, well, this, you know, basically the supplier has access to all the low income residents in the town. Um, so without the low income customer having to enter a contract without having to be responsible for additional payments, using that design, there might be a way for the customer to just receive a benefit for free, like essentially a discount that's added on their bill that comes from the solar. Um, so we we've had a lot of interest in that model, uh, hoping to see that pick up. And you know, I think the the primary challenges are, you know, getting to those customers, and then how do we get the benefits to those customers without actually um, you know, basically hindering them with an additional cost, uh, which is exactly what we don't want to happen. Thank you, Caitlin. That was a great answer. Um, and I, I think that's actually a good place to stop. Unfortunately, we only have a, a couple of minutes left here. Um, we, we have a lot of questions that we didn't get to. So apologies to folks who did not get their questions answered. Um, a few folks have their contact information in the slides, which we will circulate uh, tomorrow, um, or you can reach out directly to, to Clean Energy Group, and we can try to get you um, connected with the right person to uh, to answer any questions that you have remaining. Thank you very much to all of our presenters today. This was a great discussion, um, a, a lot developing here, a lot to think about, a lot happening in the future. And thank you to everyone that, that joined us. Um, we had a lot of folks on the line, so this is definitely an, an area that's of interest to, to a lot of different folks. Uh, with that, I, I'd like to turn things over to um, to Sam, back to Sam to to close things out for for the webinar today. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Seth. Um, so before everyone signs off, I just want to um, direct your attention to a few upcoming webinars that we have posted on your screen now um, later in October and November. Like today's webinar, those are free and open to the public, and you can read more at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. And that is also where the materials from today's webinar will be posted. So thanks again, everyone, for attending, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye.